Hey guys, welcome to Digital Reboot and welcome to my home. My name is Daniel Gilman and I'm your MC today. This is my brother, Natan. He's been a faithful rebooter. I don't know if I like that term. Comment below if that's an okay term to use, rebooter, or is that just weird? Um, guys, we are so glad to be back with Digital Reboot. We were so sad. Our whole team was so sad as we were wrapping up the first phase of Reboot. We thought it was the only phase of Reboot, but a few weeks as we were uh, wrapping it up, you students on Reboot started the hashtag Bring Back Reboot. We listened to you and we are back. So today launches the second ever Digital Reboot and you can see that we have a bunch more dates and a bunch more topics. Some of the topics include today's, so much evil, where's God? Then the next is the problem of forgiveness, something that's so personal and real for so many of us. Does God play hide and seek? A look at if God exists. Why is he not more obvious? And then finally, the creativity of God. Where we're going to be looking at beauty and art. And that's going to be from a best friend, Alonzo Julian Paul. I hope you can be there for all of that. Guys, we're going to run a poll right now that's relevant to today's topic and 2020. So we're looking at what is the worst part of 2020. I know it sounds kind of negative, but um, hey, at least we get to be with you in 2020. And today we're going to be talking about the hard stuff. We want to give away uh, another Amazon gift card as we did in phase one, uh, but with a bit of a twist today. We're not asking questions about uh, human indulgence in coffee like we did last time. No, today we're talking about puppies. Um, what do they call a drink for dogs at Starbucks? Comment below. What do they? There's an actual name for this. I learned it yesterday from my colleague, my beloved colleague Jane. What do you call a drink for dogs at Starbucks? Put that at there, and the first correct answer wins a free Amazon gift card. Today we're looking at so much evil. Where is God? And to lead us in that conversation is a man who means so much to me. One of his first jobs was serving on the ground crew for the Toronto Blue Jays professional baseball team. And when he was with them, they were known all around the world for being the fastest in all of Major League Baseball, the fastest ground crew. He served as a drummer for not one, but two rock bands. And he has now for many years, I've been a speaker with RZIM Global. Um, the first time I met him was actually at a reboot. I'd come down to Toronto to be one of the speakers, but I wasn't officially part of the RZIM team. I felt so nervous and shy being surrounded by the legends of RZIM. And he graciously invited me up to his hotel room. It was like midnight when I arrived, he invited me up to his hotel room. And we sat in his bed and ate pizza together and just chatted as brothers. I felt so safe with him, like I really belong. And I'm so excited that you're going to get to hear from him and interact with him today. And I know that you'll experience the reality of God through his words. So please give a warm digital welcome to my friend, Nathan Betts. Hey, thanks, Daniel. Uh, it's really generous introduction. Um, look, so excited to be with you guys from all over, looking at just some of you, from, uh, you know, Quebec to India to Toronto, uh, really, really uh, pumped for this session. And it's a massive, uh, very complex topic we're looking at. You know, so much evil, where is God? So let me get right to it. And I want to begin with a personal story. Years ago, when I was living in England, uh, my wife and I, at the time we were dating, and it was actually early days of our dating. We probably had been in on like three dates. And we had just one evening uh, had finished dinner at a nice restaurant. We were walking out of the restaurant to uh, the bus stop to get the bus. And while we were walking towards the bus, these people, and about like four of them, four people came to us and asked us for money. And in this particular city, that was not uh, in, the, in the city center area, that was not um, atypical. It actually happened uh, regularly. And to these people, we just said, sorry, uh, we um, uh, can't give you money. And they persisted. They kept asking us for money. And they slowly became more belligerent, aggressive, forceful, to the point that they started pushing us. And uh, we continued walking just at that point, just hoping that they would stop. And uh, we eventually just sort of got a bit uh, further ahead than we uh, than we were earlier. And then all of a sudden, uh, and just when we thought we actually had gotten away, uh, the, I remember one person is pulling on my wife's hair at the time. We, we weren't married at the time, but we were dating. And all of a sudden, then they just came at us. And I remember pushing, pulling, punching. Uh, they, they started beating up on us, really. And I'll never forget in that moment, a seeing person, there were, there were not many people actually, I don't remember many people there other than these people in that moment. And I remember one person just walked by. And as that one person walked by, I said, look, do you see what's happening there? 
they're beating up on us. Can I just, can, could you help me? I just need one person and we could, we could deal with this. And that person just walked by as if I, as if I were a ghost. And then a minute or two later, another person walked by and I, and I said the same thing. Look, you know, can't you see, you know, don't you see what's going on here? Can you help me please? And he said, call the police. And I remember I was so paralyzed maybe by anxiety or fear in that moment that I, I, I shouted to them, what, what's the number for the police? And in the UK, it's, it's 999, just as in North America, the number for emergency uh, is 911. But I didn't even know that. And I knew that, but in that moment, I was so paralyzed with fear that I said, what's the number? And they, and they actually didn't even tell me the number. Uh, and all meanwhile, it's, it's getting even more, it's, it's, getting really, it's getting really bad. And they're making these threats of what they want to do to us, what they're going to do to us. And then uh, I looked at this person, and he's in—he uh, he is a street vendor, uh, and he's doing like French fries. And in the UK, of course, they call them chips and, the, and the kebabs. And I look at him; he's in this kebab van. And I, I go over to him and say, "Look, can you help?" And uh, he, in a flash, comes out, and it's just—he is almost like this mythological creature, just picking these people off of us and helping us. And we we're able to get away. Now, as I think back to that moment, I'll never forget these words that just seem to be so disconnected from the response I was getting. And the words I kept saying to different people were, can't you see? Don't you see what's happening? Don't, can't you see what is happening? And I said that to the two people that passed and then the one person who eventually helped. And the reason why I say this is because I think that is a fundamental question. This question, don't you see? Can't you see? Those questions are fundamental to who we are and how we express and voice uh, our question, our anxiety, our curiosity, our pain to those around us, but also to God when we are experiencing, enduring, and encountering pain, evil. Loneliness, isolation, anxiety. For many of us, we would also lump it into just that one word, evil. What I want to say is, and I'm going to, of course, you know, in the short time that we've allocated, because we really want to get to your questions. In the short time that I, I, I have here, I'm going to do sort of a whistle stop tour through how, just to understand how do we even begin to make sense of evil in this world? And what I want to do is really look at, one, uh, what is the nature of this world? What is the nature of God? And where are we in all this? What's the nature of this world? What's the nature of God? And where do we fit into all this? And I want to begin by saying that actually when we come to this question of evil, make no mistake, this is not a religious question. It's not as if this is a Christianity question or a faith question. It is a human being question. It's not as if um, only Christianity needs to come up with an answer for this. No, no matter where you are on the spectrum of faith, whether you adhere to faith or no faith or actually to plurality of faiths, no matter where you are, us you know, human beings, we, we find no escape here. At some point, we need to pay up. We have to answer and find something that is going to help us make sense of this very thorny jagged edge question. Um, so let me get right to it. When we want to make sense of this question, I think it's going to help to, first of all, try to make sense of the world in which we live. Because the world in which we live clearly is, is flawed. It's broken. Uh, and so let me begin with uh, explaining it through five, uh, explaining the world as if it's uh, five Shakespearean acts. And I'm actually borrowing this from a theologian who I think gives us a really good picture of just helping us understand the world in which you and I live. And he, he describes the world in five through five Shakespearean acts. And the first act, so to speak, is creation. This is where God created the world. Uh, and he created uh, the heavens, the earth, human beings, animals, uh, and called all of it good. That's the first act of the world. The second act is the fall. And when that word the fall is used, it denotes 
brokenness. It denotes uh, effectively in terms of humanity, us falling from goodness. Uh, there's, uh, it, it's through sin, this disorder, this um, missing of the mark, so to speak, that causes, that brings uh, sin into this world. It, and it has implications for everything. Not only for humanity in that our relationship with God in that moment was broken and damaged, but the whole order of things, the natural order, everything around us and inside it was broken in that moment. The fall. So creation, the fall, and then uh, Israel. This one theologian uh, who really, when, we're, when we use the word theologian, uh, we're talking about someone who studies God. Uh, whether they be in undergraduate studies at college or a person who um, that's what they do, that they spend there's their every waking hour studying uh, God. And this one theologian call, looks at the first stage as creation, next stage is uh, fall, and the next one is Israel. And this is the stage where God uh, calls the people to live before him, to be faithful to him, to follow him, to engage with him in relationship, but also to make him known to others, to actually let other people in to this beauty, goodness, truth of who God is, this God who actually loves us so much that he rescues us. He redeems us. He actually wants to make us in our brokenness. He wants to make us whole. Um, so you have creation, fall, Israel, and then Jesus. Jesus really is the story of God coming to earth in first century Palestine, God in flesh, living, teaching, going to the cross, dying, and rising again, Renew it, making a way so that actually we can have a relationship, a personal relationship with God. And the fifth act, this person says, is us, the church. People actually choose to follow Christ. So this, this model of understanding the world through five Shakespearean acts is creation, fall, Israel, God calling out to a people, choosing a people to, to live for him, to make him known, and also invite other people into this relationship. And then Jesus, God in flesh, and then us. Now, when we start to just get a handle, and of course, this is, I'm moving faster, but when we get a handle, when we even begin to get a handle on the nature of this world, we understand that. Um, we're still living in that uh, broken place. But the world around us clearly, especially the, this, this, the pandemic in which we're living right now, has put a magnifying glass on how flawed we are as human beings, how damaged the world is. But it also has shown that actually within, that frame, uh, within this framework of a world that is broken, there's the capacity, yes, to do wrong and evil, but there's also the capacity, the ability to do right. But that's the nature of freedom but also freedom that is abused, misused, that we can do wrong, but also we have the power to do what is right. So that gives us a starting point to understanding the world in which we live, creation, fall, Israel, uh, Jesus, and then we're in that fifth act right now, having this invitation to follow God, this God who actually has made himself known, who loves us, who wants us to be in relationship with him. Then we have to understand, to, to help us understand not only this world, but to understand God is going to ultimately help us make sense of uh, not only evil, but actually how God is in this problem. Because we come back to that question that not only I, but I'm sure many of you have asked is, God, don't you understand? Don't you see? And those, I think, are two of the big questions that we're asking when, we, when, we, when we're going through a time of pain. We're asking, God, look, do you understand what's happening? Do you get what's happening around? Do you see what's happening? And we get a glimpse into understanding what God thinks of evil when we look to one uh, story. There are many stories, but one story highlights this, and this is the story of one of Jesus Christ's close friends. Uh, in John's Gospel, now we have four uh, biographical biographical accounts of Jesus: uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in John, this fourth book in the New Testament, we see that um, in the eleventh chapter, there Jesus Christ's friend Lazarus is dying, and he actually ends up dying prematurely. 
And what's interesting is if we're looking to see, okay, this is God in flesh, Jesus Christ. If that is God in flesh, we want to know how is he going to respond to this when something so sad, so tragic in the loss of Lazarus happens? How is he going to respond? And what's interesting is Jesus does not respond with words. He responds with tears. Just think, God in flesh, his first response is not a correction. When you and I go through pain, God's first response is not a correction. It's not even an answer. It is tears. He weeps with you. He weeps with me in our pain. But more than that, what we find in the narrative, and this is where we have to rescue the translation, and going back, you know, the translation of the New Testament, much of it was in Greek. And in this particular chapter, the words used to describe Jesus, not only do we see sadness, but we see anger. There's this, this idea of Jesus being furious. There's this furious indignation that Jesus expresses at evil. Death, as we know, it's described by Paul, who wrote many letters in the New Testament, as the final enemy. There's a wrongness. There's a hellishness to death. It's not right. And Jesus expresses that pain through tears and through anger. But we're, if we're on, wanting to know not only how Jesus sees, but how he acts, we see part of that in the Lazarus story. He sees and he weeps. He's angry. But does he do anything about it? Well, Jesus ultimately shows us what he does by going to the cross. The cross of Christ shows us that Jesus takes on the enormity of evil. And by dying and rising again, it tells that evil is real, but that also evil does not have the last word. God has the last word. Now, let me just back up a moment, because what's very interesting and real and something that we feel is when we are going through something very hard, we don't, we don't often, I don't say personally, I haven't felt God in many of those moments when I've been going through something hard. What's very interesting, and this is pointed out by another theologian, a German uh, a guy named Martin Luther, who has uh, long passed away. But he made the point that actually, if you were to go back into that story of the cross, and if you actually were following Jesus in that moment, and you're on that hill, seeing before you Jesus on the cross dying, what you would have thought in that moment is not victory. Now, we look back to the cross and we see, hey, that was Jesus Christ taking on evil and he actually won. He came back to life. But in that moment, what you would have been thinking is you backed the wrong horse. You actually put your trust in the wrong spot. That's what you would have been thinking because Rome was seen as evil. And if you're going to defeat evil, well, you wouldn't be doing it by going on a cross. That was that cross was seen as something for criminals. And Jesus is there actually not defeating evil. He, it looks like he's being defeated by evil. He's the one getting crushed. And Martin Luther made the point that if ever there were a place where you would have said God is present, that would have been the last place. But it was as if, in secret, the place where everyone would have said God is profoundly absent was the exact place where God was present. Because if that's God on the cross, it means that in, a, in the face of evil, God was present. God was there. He wasn't felt, but he was there. It tells you and I that actually, what was, well, let's just back up for a moment. What does all of this tell us? Well, it tells us, one, that actually the world in which we live is broken. And Christianity doesn't hide that. It doesn't try to like put it under the carpet. It says, yeah, the world in which we live is broken. There is death, and that's wrong. That's, there's, there's a wrongness to that. But God in Jesus Christ has acted. He's made a way. So even in this moment, we can have peace. The question is, how is that peace real? Okay? So let me land the plane here. We need to make sense of the, the world. The world is broken. Creation, fall, Israel, Jesus, now us. But when we're looking at Jesus, that reveals the character of God. We need to know what is God like. And if that is God on the cross, it tells us that God is love. God loves us. 
so much so that he gave up his own his, his God gave his only son for us. Now, how does peace, how does how do all these things that Christians often talk about, how we can have peace, we can experience God, how does it actually become real for us? Uh, as to, as opposed to something that we just wish for. And I want to suggest to you this, and let me land it here. Perhaps the most powerful way in which we know God is with us is the fact that he lives in us. I remember speaking in uh, Vancouver. Uh, it was last year. And I remember a student came to the microphone and said, look, you keep talking about how we can experience God. And, you know, I felt God here now and his presence there. And he's like, he looked at me and he said, I've never felt God. I've never experienced him. So what do you have to say about that? And I remember, you know, sharing a response with him that I hope would bring him comfort. And I remember talking to my wife, Brittany, the next day about it. And she said, maybe the greatest hope we have is not necessarily feeling God all the time, although that is a gift and that does happen. Maybe it's the fact that God lives in us. That's how we know he's with us. The amazing news is this is not just sort of something we wish for, almost like it's a, as if it's a prayer request to God. It's a promise that if we engage in a relationship with God, the God that has revealed himself to us in Jesus Christ, um, he makes his home in us. And there's a, there's a mystery to that. But the mystery just, it simply means that it's very difficult to understand. But that doesn't mean it's not real. It means that actually if we say, God, I'm going to give you my life, Come, come into me. He actually lives inside us. He takes up residence. He, he makes his home inside us. And that means actually we always have God with us if we are engaging with him in relationship. So the challenge for us here today is first to actually get a handle on what kind of world uh, we live in. And we live in a world that, yes, things were created and it, it, God said all of it was good. But there was this fall, there was brokenness, there was disorder. And through that, it just wreaked havoc on all of creation, both in us and outside. But God and Jesus has made a way so that we can actually be made whole again. And ultimately, that, that wholeness, that wholeness comes through us inviting him into our lives. He can be with us because he lives in us. So I want to challenge you with that, but also offer an invitation to you for that. Have you made that? Have you made that commitment? Because for all of those of us who would say, you know, I don't experience God with us. You got God with me. The comforting words of Jesus simply say, hey, if you, if you call to me, I will make my home with you. You call to me, I will answer. So it's a challenge and it's an, an invitation. Uh, I will now move, we're now going to move to a time of question and answer. Uh, and I'm going to bring back uh, Daniel, uh, who introed and set up the, the event for us today. Uh, just a brief word of Dan about Daniel. Um, he mentioned on the front end how, you know, he actually mentioned a lot about me and was very generous. But just one quick word about Daniel is, if you ever get a chance to meet Daniel and uh, you want to make him happy, you want to get him a pizza, okay? Get him a pizza. We both love pizza. Actually, he, he loves a lot of things, but he loves a particular pizza. He likes the spicy pierogi pizza at Boston Pizza. So I'm just going to put that out. If you want to actually make him happy, go for it, get that pizza, and just take my word for it. Daniel, over Nathan, to you. Thanks, Nathan. And everyone, you've already made me happy. Uh, we're so glad that you've tuned in. Uh, here, the theme is no question off limits. So keep asking your questions on any topic. Uh, of course, if it's on topic, it has the greatest chance of being of being asked. You can also vote on the questions. Nathan, thank you so much uh, for sharing both from, from your own experience and also from what the Bible and what Jesus shines light into the question of where is God in a world of so much evil. Um, a tied for the first, uh, tied for the most amount of votes is a question that comes all the way from Jivan in India. Uh, he, uh, he's, miss, he, he's skipping on some other incredible events to be uh, with us right now. I think it's probably about, is it like 2 a.m. where you are, Jeevan? Uh, we're so grateful that you are up in the middle of the night tuning in. Uh, here's his question, Nathan. He says, if there is evil, we also imply that there uh, lies some good. We do good because we have the bright light of Christ shining in us. 
in this dark world. We get eternal life through the blood spilled for us. So what about the person who does good but is not a Christian? Yeah, that's a great question. What about that person? Uh, you know, I think what I would say is it really depends. I think for one, um, you know, when uh, you're asking that question, uh, first of all, I think it's important to, to validate the things that they're doing uh, good. I mean, those things are good. If, you know, thing, acts of generosity, hospitality, compassion, mercy, justice, those are good things. Um, so I think what I would say is I'd get behind that, first of all, and say, hey, that's that's great. That's something that we uh, should allot and should uh, uh, admire. Um, those are things worth getting behind. I, I think um, I, I would say sometimes these things are complex. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, one, the person actually might not be a Christian because there are. I mean, you, uh, you don't necessarily need to be a Christian, for instance, to do good. You can actually be, we, I mean, the world, uh, even like the history of Western civilization is instructive to us in that, that actually you don't necessarily uh, need to believe in God, for instance, to, to be good. But it does require some appeal to God uh, because if you don't have any objective uh, point of reference, then, then, then I think even to the front end of your question, when you talked about good and evil there, in a way, all these things, instead of being objective, they become relative, they become subjective. What is good and what is evil if you don't have any objective point of reference? Now, I know that's a bit technical, but let me, let me call full, come full circle. One, what I'd say there is, first, the point still remains that what that person's doing what that person might be doing in terms of generosity, hospitality, compassion, justice, mercy, is still a good thing. What I would say is um, taking it down to sort of like the fine print neighborhood level, um, I would engage with that person in a conversation uh, about Jesus and whether they actually know that know Jesus. Um, uh, you know, it, it, I think the question... Uh, hints at, you know, what about that person who does good but is not a Christian? Um, you know, I think the hint is, you know, where, like, what does eternity look like for that person? Uh, well, I think by engaging in a conversation, we're able to find out where that person is because sometimes actually uh, these, you know, there are many people who actually might be a Christian, but they might not actually call themselves a Christian. And that's important for us because we do live right now, right now, we live in this flashpoint moment of labels and categories. You are this. I am this. That person over that is, is that. They belong to that person. There's a, this identity moment of you are identified with that group and that group and that group. And I think we actually should be careful to not necessarily place a label on a person because they might not have actually labeled themselves Christian. So a question that you might want to ask that person is, hey, do you know Jesus Christ? Uh, I actually, it, that is actually for me instructive and challenging. One of my professors once said that actually when we get to heaven, one of the biggest surprises we will get is when we look around and see everybody who actually showed up. And what that tells us is not as though that's, you know, what we, what we, when we get to heaven, they will be disconnected uh, from what we see here as much as there might be people that, wow, we didn't know they actually committed their lives to Christ. So what I would say is this person who's actually committing and who's actually doing great things, they actually might be closer to Christ than you think. So asking questions, engaging them in questions could be a really helpful way by actually maybe sharing with them with clarity who Jesus is. I hope that helps. Thank you, Nathan. Um, you know, one of the things as you're speaking that, that I think of an answer to this question about um, how can people still do good things even if they don't have like the spirit of God like um, abiding in us. Mm -hmm. um, if, 
we're not a Christian. Uh, we're still doing good things. And I think about the fact that in the opening pages of the Bible, God says that he made man, that he made man and woman, male and female in his image. And there's a sense that I'm, I'm now in my 30s and I was chatting with a friend recently about how, um, it was actually Alonzo, some of you know him. And we we're talking about how like the older we get, the more we, we realize that like we are our dad. Like there's little things that we love our dads, but there's little things they do, ways that they stand, just mannerisms and speech that we, even the way that they inter that they interact with our, our moms and we interact with our wives, that we just see like we are our dads. Um, and there's a sense to which because every single one of us, whether they're a Christian or not, are made in God's image, and in that respect, we have this like this like family resemblance to God. And so just the other day I was chatting with uh, a 17 year old who's an atheist. He uh, would embody postmodern philosophy. And we were talking about justice issues. He's really passionate about it, uh, but he doesn't believe anything is necessarily true. And so I, I asked him, is, is, um, is the abuse of little children wrong? And he said, well, it's wrong from the child's perspective, but he hesitated from being able to say that it's actually wrong. He was implying that like it's well maybe like it's not actually wrong from the abuser's perspective and there are i know a lot of non-christians there are atheists agnostics and a whole plethora of others who would um, be completely against that kind of postmodern philosophy that there's no true good and evil even if they don't have a, re a way that they can make sense of it of course we find that if you can make sense only fully of the reality of goodness and evil and justice and injustice in god but there's that family resemblance where God's heart beats for justice. It beats for goodness. And we see that reflecting and even like beating in the very heart of people who he's made, but don't yet believe in him. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for the question. Uh, we're going to go on to the next question. This is the top voted question. It's from Kathleen. And she asks, Nathan, how do you share the gospel without being pushy? <laughs> that is, that's a great question. I love that question. Um, I think really what I would say there is one, be yourself. And what I mean by that is just don't try to be someone else. Like for in, uh, so when I say this, I'm going to act as though I'm giving myself advice. So we're just reminding myself of stuff that I actually need to know, need to be reminded of. One, I would say to you, you know, uh, Kathleen, yeah, be yourself. Um, uh, uh, you know, I remember th there's this uh, 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 store, there's this shop uh, chain, sandwich chain, a coffee shop in the, uh, the UK. They have some in, I think, the US too. When I lived in Toronto, I just wish so badly that they that ha they had them there. They didn't have them. I don't think that, maybe Daniel, you might know, but they, it's called pret a manger It's just a sandwich shop they have in, in the UK and I think in Europe as well. But on different things, like uh, on, uh, I think I remember on certain beverages, they would have the label uh, best when chilled. And then under it, it would say, like all of us. Uh, and uh, I thought, yeah, actually, in a way, we're, we're all are at our best when we're chilled. In other words, when we're just ourselves. Uh, and let me just put a caveat there and say, ourselves before God, um, in who he's actually made us to be, not trying to be someone else. Uh, but actually just being the person that God has called us to be. So how do we engage someone without being pushy? First, try be intentional about not trying to be someone else, but actually be the best person that God has made us to be. Two, practically ask questions. Often when we get into conversations and wanting to engage people with faith, we think that we just need to come up with all the answers, just trot those answers mm -hmm. out. Um, that's not really how relationships work. As a matter of fact, some of the best, conversations I have uh, I remember for me the most impactful uh, conversation I've had is when people have asked me good questions not necessarily the sophisticated answers that they've given me the questions that they've offered me have have been the most meaningful Jesus always does this and the word pushy I've actually never heard that word used to describe Jesus. Jesus was disruptive. Yeah, he was disruptive, but it was always in a redemptive way. There was this disrupt, disruptive redemption that Jesus was after. 
So we also need, don't need to be afraid about doing that. So first, be yourself. Be yourself before God. Two, ask questions. Three, I, I would say let, let's get into that space of actually not being afraid to be uh, disruptive, uh, disruptively redemptive. Meaning, you know, when, uh, uh, when I've been in conversation with people, sometimes I've had, had to say, do you really believe that? Like, do you really believe that? Um, and I think sometimes the question can actually be more disruptive than a statement. Uh, I'm trying to think. Um, it, uh, there was a friend I was uh, uh, talking to, and actually we had loads of conversations, but we would never have conversations of faith because he always would be, uh, he would always make jokes about it. And I'll never forget one time we finally had a conversation of faith, and he raised it up. Uh, it was after it was on a Monday. It was after Sunday, and he knew I went to church the day before. And he looked to me and he said, "What do you have that I would ever want?" That was that for a question. And he was speaking about my faith. He looked at me and said, "What what do you have that I I would ever want?" And I knew my friend. I knew that actually in, at that time he was a sex addict. Truly, like no exaggeration, he was a sex addict. And I looked at him and I said. I can wake up every morning with a clear conscience. That's what I have that you might want. And the reason why I could say something like that was not to be feisty, but because I knew him. And I had I actually had a conversation with a friend just a few days earlier that uh, he reminded me of this truth, that actually by God's grace, by, by God offering forgiveness I can be made clean. And I'll never forget when I told my friend that. I wasn't, and I wasn't even trying to be like a different person. I was just saying, look, the fact is I can wake up every morning and have a clear conscience. Uh, he looked at me and said, wow, I don't even know what that is. So let's, let's go down the line here. One, be yourself. Two, ask questions. Three, uh, don't be afraid to be disruptively redemptive. And that means, be, effectively, that's a way of saying just be courageous. Um, sometimes saying the hard thing uh, is going to be saying the right thing. But remember, that's often confused with being a jerk. We don't want to be a jerk. don't Because uh, if people reject us, let them reject us for following Christ, not because we're stupid. Let's not be dumb. Okay? So, so I think that's really important because I think sometimes, uh, and I'm going to throw my hands up, sometimes people are rejecting the stuff I'm, the stuff I've said, not because I've said something for Christ. It's because I've acted pretty dumb, and just like putting it really plain. So we don't want to be like that. We want to be people who actually are courageous, like Jesus, truth telling, like Jesus. But also, lastly, here, take genuine interest, in people. If people know that we are genuinely interested in them, not viewing them as projects, that in and of itself is the antidote to being pushy. The, the problem begins when we start viewing people as projects. Like over here, I've got to fix this. I've got to fix that. No one wants to be fixed. Because as soon as we get into that zone of like, I need to fix you, you stop being a person and you start being something that is just not human. We all are human and we need to be treated like that. And the gift that Jesus has given to us in so many ways is the gift of at least giving us the dignity that he engages people with respect, with love, asking questions, uh, being courageous, and being genuine in the conversations, seeing people as they are. So I hope that that helps. That's a starting point to really, I think, I think the, those are all different points that provide, I think, a pretty good antidote to being pushy. Absolutely. Thanks, Nathan. Hey guys, the Bible verse you can feast on um, after hours, after this is over, is 1 Peter 3.15. And this has been a theme verse, I know, for Ravi Zacharias, so many of our team, um, which speaks about um, being able to share the gospel. I'll just read it to you, 1 Peter 3.15. But in your heart, set apart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. And there's something here about highlighting the fact that often we get to really share a faith as an answer to a question. And it's a question specifically about the hope that we have within us. 
So it's specifically in a year like 2020, when we're going through so much pain that people are able to see if we're actually hoping in anything that's beyond the darkness. And so as we're able to be people who are cultivating hope, hope in Jesus, hope in Jesus regarding the, the news headlines and the brokenness in our lives, people will be curious and they will ask us. And you'll also see in that verse, read it and meditate it on it in your own time. There's so much more, but it talks about like being prepared. So that means taking time to study, to read the Bible, to spend time in prayer, to be on Reboot and be learning from the speaking team. And, and that's all ways that you're preparing yourself to be able to articulate the hope. But more than anything, we prepare to share faith without being pushy by being people of hope in Jesus. Mm. Hey, the next question is from Kathleen. And this is in response, Nathan, to um, the question we answered from Jivan um, from India um, when we were talking, I think specifically getting at how you mentioned that maybe some people are Christians who don't think they're Christians. And this is a question of clarification. I think it's really important from Kathleen. So Kathleen, thank you for your question. She yeah. asks, Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my father. Does this mean that if a Christian does not share the fact that they're a Christian, they will go to hell? Um, can you say the question again, Daniel? Sure, I will. She said, Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my father. Does this mean that if a Christian does not share the fact that they're a Christian, they will go to hell? Um, Kathleen, I think that um, what, what I believe what you're asking about is following up to Nathan's question where he was, uh, or his answer, where he was speaking about how um, we might get to heaven and there's people who surprise us by their being there. And when he said that, what, what my mind turned to is Luke 18, where Jesus famously shares this really a cutting parable is really challenging to my heart because you have this person that would identify as a follower of God and be very public about that. Um, they wouldn't have yet used the word Christian, but you and I would have like, that, that's our version of like the, the Christian who is just so very um, public and so showy about how sincere they are. And so Jesus compares this person with this tax collector who is someone who would have done a lot of things that they would be ashamed of, that we would be ashamed of them for that we would have seen them as kind of the refuse of society. Um, some people compare today's bylaw officers to tax collectors, but that might not be fair, but people that like nobody really likes. And, um, and yet the way that Jesus tells the story, it's actually that person who truly is a follower of God. And Jesus beautifully, it's Luke 18, look it up. Jesus beautifully recounts how there's a person in humility, not in a showy way, but like humbled himself before God and um, confessed his sin repented before God through tears and found exactly what Nathan just spoke about, about a clean conscience, which is an amazing gift that only comes from God uh, in that place of, of humble privacy. And so in that respect, I think Jesus is challenging us that um, we might, um, when we look at um, how come there's people who are doing good things and um, is that, is that, does that person even know God? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm certain that Nathan, uh, believes and that we're both saying that people are saved because through the faith in Jesus uh, mm -hmm. and Jesus Lord. Uh, um, but it's not so much that that they're not placing their faith in Jesus as maybe we might be slow to realize um, who are people actually uh, of faith. And this is an embarrassing, humbling story I can tell from my own life. But um, um, I used to be part of a team that would work among those who are homeless and in urban intense poverty on the streets. And there were people who just didn't, um, they didn't come across like the, the person that I think of as, um, honestly, as, as a Christian or like as, a, as someone who is sold out for Jesus. These are people who um, are, are um, struggling with some intense addictions and um, their life seems very messy. And I, I realized as I got to know some of these gentlemen is that um, I had begun to imagine a Christian as, as being associated with middle class Canada, to be honest, because that's a lot of the people inhabiting my church. And yet, as I got to befriend these guys, I found people who um, I saw first. The first thing I noticed about them was like the that the heartbeat of God in these people, who were people who were so kind and good and shining a light in the dark streets. And as I got to know them, I was I was humbled to realize these people are like they believe in Jesus. They have surrendered their life to Him. The some of the struggles that and and stuff they're battling do look very different than what uh, a lot of my friends are dealing with. And yet these people definitely know God and have surrendered their life to him. 
And so, I, uh, Nathan, I'd love your insights um, as a follow up to that earlier question. Yeah, um, I, uh, Daniel, I don't have much to say because I think you just really filled that in like so well. I, uh, I think what I would say, Kathleen, is yeah, I think you make a good point, and, and I think maybe let me be clear: uh, we have we have clarity in what Jesus says about. Um, what it looks like uh, for eternity. Eternity, in terms of people who will have everlasting life, are those who actually submit and uh, commit their lives to Jesus Christ, engage in that relationship. Um, so I think uh, that's the only thing I would say. That I think the challenge is, it comes down to what Daniel just mentioned, sometimes that looks different than we would actually at first, anticipate. It can be surprising because we sometimes categorize people into like, okay, if you are a Christian, then you must look like this. Now, let me also be clear. It shouldn't be, there shouldn't be a disconnect. If there are things that someone is, uh, someone might be doing that are clearly against what who Jesus is and what he's about, that's something that should be, that we should, um, that should make us say, hold on, what's going on here? But, if it's say something like what Daniel said, like a class issue, um, or they don't look the right way, then that isn't necessarily an in, an indication of uh, being Christian or being with Jesus or not. It might actually be, mean we need to readjust our lens of what it means to be a true follower of Christ. Um, so I hope that I hope that helps. Is that is that clear, Daniel? I think that's clear how I'm explaining there. I appreciate it, and Kathy, thank. You much for your question and um, here's the next question i can fit in two more questions maybe i'll take this one real quick and i'm going to throw a much more difficult question to nathan uh, <laughs> people. so um but first from josiah how is it that so many people think that the earth is all fine um and moral that we shouldn't compromise um how do we stand oh the question just jump here's the question how is that so many people think that the earth is fine and good when the world is so desperately wicked i'm going to ask that one more time um so here's a question from josiah how is it that so many people think that the earth is all fine and good when the world is so desperately wicked? And Josiah, thanks for the question. Um, I might respectfully disagree with your premise that so many people think the earth is all fine. Uh, in, in my experience, getting to spend time with high school students across Canada, university students across the world, I found that today, like maybe never before, um, at least millennials and Generation Z believe and know that the earth is broken. And you see it in this like this heartbeat for justice, both from Christians and non-Christians, the demand for equality. It, we can see it even uh, a few weeks ago at the end of May, um, where so many people, Christians and non-Christians, um, were using the hashtag Blackout Tuesday with the black square crying for racial equality. Um, we, we see it that there's this um, recognition that the world is broken. So many people um, are advocates now for um, fighting human trafficking. It's a, that's been a problem throughout the centuries, but today people care about that and carry that burden in their hearts. But perhaps what you are recognizing is that so few people actually act upon their convictions. And I, I think that this might go back to something I learned in high school. It's called the bystander effect. It was in like the Challenge and Change Society people taking on Ontario, like grade 11 or 12, um, the bystander effect. The more people at the scene of the crime, the less likely anyone will do anything about it. And so there's a sense to which that not, it's not just the specific scene of the crime, but we've never had such an aware generation when it comes to injustices and exploitation. And yet there's this overwhelming passivity. I wonder if perhaps digital media has uh, uh, awakened people's awareness to the reality of evil. And yet there's this passivity that comes as people feel paralyzed by the pandemic of evil. But there's actually a, a grain of hope in the bystander effect, which is that the more people who step in to intervene, it snowballs and the more people will intervene. So sociologists have found, which is one of the reasons that I love the mission and the person of Jesus. Um, Jesus defines his ministry, all that he's about um, from the ancient scroll of Isaiah, uh, which reads, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me to proclaim the good news to the poor, uh, to bind up the brokenhearted, to bring freedom to those in captivity. And it goes on with just beautiful, true words. 
uh, John in John uh, 1 5 introduces the mission of Jesus in the last words saying light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it and then more than 20 times in the biographies of Jesus the Gospels he says follow me and so we see in that that Jesus is at work intervening he refuses to be passive and he calls us through all the genres of the Bible he calls us clearly to join him in being light in the darkness and so um, yeah, so that's such a good question, and I hope that it challenges you and me as we discuss the reality of the problem of evil, that this isn't simply a philosophical question, but it's a question about what we're going to do today, joining God in responding to evil. Um, we respond through prayer, we respond through being able to don donate with our money, we respond by being people who actually speak up and get involved in the work of bringing hope and healing to this broken and dark world. But I'm starting to preach, so let's just calm down for a minute, and we have time for one last question. Um, so this is a, this is a big one, Nathan, and we'll uh, we'll end it here. We still have some big announcements, so please, everyone, stay with us until the very end, 3 p.m. Uh, but here's the last question, Nathan: How can a good God exist if He has the power to eradicate evil and yet doesn't? Mm. Well. Yeah, this is a great question, um, and it's a question that's been asked uh, through the ages. Um, you know, if a good God exists, um, how can He exist if He's not eradicating evil? Is that do I have that right? Hmm. Well, I think um, let's break this question down. I think it's going to help if we look um, first of all. Um, there is a sense in which, as I mentioned from the beginning of my talk, even when we come to this question, uh, there's a Judeo-Christian framework within which we're asking the question. We're, so when we ask this question, the language itself uh, assumes a moral framework that comes from the Judeo-Christian framework. Now, let me just pause it for a moment and say, because some of you might be saying, oh, what, what was all this, Judeo-Christian? Uh, just it's combining the Jewish world, the Jewish understanding of God, how the world works, to Christian. Christian, uh, we as Christians, for me, I consider myself a Christian, a follower of Jesus. We inherited, we've inherited, uh, we have a rich heritage uh, uh, that comes uh, from uh, our Jewish uh, brothers and sisters that you find particularly in the Hebrew scriptures. You know, for instance, Moses and in the old. Uh, all of what we see in the Ten Commandments, all this stuff is a heritage that we now uh, have been given that has been fulfilled, filled in by Jesus. That's what, So that's a long way of saying, what do I mean by Judeo-Christian framework? Now, here's the thing. The reason why I say that is because outside of that value system, the language changes. And I think for some of us, for many of us, we might not notice that because we use these words all the time when we come into contact with horrible things like rape, murder, abuse, bombing, bullying, manipulation, those things. All of a sudden, we have these words bubble up to the surface of good, evil. Why isn't God doing something about it? But I want to actually just uh, before, because I think this is uh, what makes this question so complex is that it's not only intellectual, which I'm working through right now, but also emotional. I'm going to come to the emotional part in a moment. But let's just st stay with me here um, while I work through the intellectual part. Um, the Judeo-Christian framework gives us the words of good and evil because ultimately goodness, for instance, when we look at the word good, good is rooted in terms of acts of goodness, uh, what we would use to describe as good, comes from and is rooted in God, who is seen as not just bestowing goodness, but actually is good. Like goodness is inherent to who he is. So that gives us an objective point of reference. Evil, uh, from a Christian standpoint, is seen uh, as... Um, uh, the violation of purpose. It's against good. It's the antithesis. It's the very opposite of that. Now, the, the here's uh, wh where um, it, it sort of gets intense. If you remove God 
from that equation, those words of good and evil, they start, they, they lose their value because uh, in a framework, for instance, that does not have God. So for people who would say, I don't believe in God. Uh, well, you know, actually, Ravi Zacharias pointed this out, and um, he's not the only one who's pointed this out, but it's been very helpful. If you have something like good and evil, uh, if, you, those, if you're making a differentiation, you have something that uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, who wrote Mere Christianity, he talks about a moral law. Moral law is the thing that differentiates between good and evil. It's something that helps you understand this is good over here and this is evil over there. But if to have that kind of law, and whatever you want to call it, C.S. Lewis called it a moral law, um, you have to have someone to bestow that. You have to have to someone who actually adjudicates and watches over and gives you that law. Now, Lewis put worse at language, and this is what theists, is what people who believe in God would call a moral law giver. That's God. Christians believe that the one who gives us that moral law is God. But here's the thing. The problem with that whole structure is if you take away the Judeo-Christian framework, you don't, you don't have that language anymore. Um, it's a big struggle. So the question, the way self-destructs, um, Christianity actually gives us meaning to that. Now, here's the thing. Uh, a lot of people will come to that question and say, look, you know, if God is good, why doesn't he eradicate evil? I would say, uh, look, that's a real, that's a, that's a problem. It is a problem. So I would say, first of all, to the question, it's a great question, but also it's a massively hard question. But here's the thing. The temptation when we get into this space is to say, it's going to be easier without God. Uh, and that, uh, I want to say, is a possibility. We can because, again, we come back to the nature of this world, and the nature of this world is one in which we have capacity to choose. We don't have to choose God. We don't have to engage in relationship with Him. He does not strong arm us. But this idea that it's going to be easier without God, that's also a fallacy. That's actually doesn't make it easier. Because here's the thing. The world in which we live is tough. And, but the thing is, though, God in Christ responded to that because Jesus himself told his followers, told his friends, look, in the world, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have difficulty. Things are going to be really hard. But take heart. I have overcome the world. So Jesus, in those words, in a way, tells us what the world is like. That actually, look, there's a lot of junk in this world. You're going to face it. It's not a matter of if. It's actually when. You will go through stuff that is going to feel like hell. But take heart. I have overcome it. I've actually, I'm the one who's actually defeated it. So we call this, as Christians, we call this space that we live in right now, 21st century, 2020, this year that actually many would say is hell with everything that's happened. We call the space, Christians call it a now and not yet world. Yes, there is evil. It's real. That is a problem. But we have to ask, what, they, what worldview, what system of belief best makes sense of it? Christianity acknowledges that this is a problem. And it says, look, your best hope is with a God who's actually defeated it. You remove God from the equation. You go from the problem with hope. You remove God and you now go to the problem without hope. It's that simple. You have a God who actually has entered into this world that is full of mess. And he gets messy. He gets dirty so that we can be made clean. But you remove God from evil, and you're still left with a problem, but this time you're left with a problem without hope. So what I would say is, look, you asked a very good question, but um, it's a problem for everybody. The question is, what, what system of belief is going to give you the hope that you can bank on that's going to outlast you? And the only faith, and this is not actually slagging or uh, uh, trash-talking other faiths. It actually just is comparing and contrasting. When you do a panoramic view of all the faiths, if, uh, you name it, there is no other faith in which you find God offering hope, but God himself offering hope, not through teaching and beliefs, not through instructions, but by himself entering into the problem. So I think the problem is the problem. But you have one equation over here in which you find God giving us hope. And over here, no God, no hope. That's, the, that's, that's where we're left with. Um, so 
let me land it on this. And I'd say, look, I personally know this myself. For some of you at this point, you might think, wow, this is really intellectual. I don't think about like that when I go through stuff like that. And I actually understand that. I don't, I actually, full disclosure, I don't myself. It's usually when the dust settles that I actually go through this thought process. But I will say this. I, for me, my, the, the way in which I have encountered hard things in life has been through loss. And when, in 2016, I lost my father and he died suddenly. And as I thought about my father and what I miss, uh, I miss him so much. There are two things that come to mind. One is I miss his presence. It, just being with him, not him saying anything, not him doing anything, just him, him being in the room. And as I thought about that, I will never be able to see my father again until um, I see him in heaven. But in this space and time, the promise of Christianity says, yes, you will not have your dad again in this, on this side of eternity, but you have God's presence. I have God's presence with me. The other thing I miss is my father's voice. Whenever he would speak, it, there, was a, there was a strength, there was a calm that came through my father, just his voice. And what I actually find as I thought about missing my father's presence and his voice, I actually listened uh, recently, I listened to a voicemail that he left me. I still have it on my phone. And sometimes I just played over and over and over and over. The reason why I play that voicemail that he left me, I remember he left it for me in 2016, just a couple months before he died. It's like a 15 second, maybe 20 second voicemail. The reason why I listen to it is because he's talking to me. I want to hear him talking to me. The promise, the assurance, the beauty, hope, truth of Christianity is that we have God the Father who speaks to us. He speaks to us and he is with us. I will not have my father again on this side of eternity, but I will always have God himself with me. His voice speaking and calming me. The question is, will we engage with this God? Yes, there, there's a problem. The, the, the problem of evil is a real problem. The question is, what faith best makes sense of it? Christianity not only helps us make sense of it, it offers hope, hope that will actually outlive us, but also it brings comfort of God's voice, of God's presence with us. There's nothing else like that. You can search like I've done for years upon years, and you will not find it. Hope, peace, comfort, relationship. It's for you. It comes offered to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Will we say yes? Will we commit? My prayer is that you will. Thanks for listening. Nathan, thank you so much. Thank you for taking us right into uh, the mo most personal parts of your life and being able to show us the reality of God's comfort there. I think as you uh, wrap up, I, I think about you mentioned what the different like, kind of stages, like a, like a, like a play of, mm -hmm. of history and God's redemption story. And I think right now, like you said, we're in the now and not yet. And there's a sense to which we feel like, uh, how come God hasn't vanquished all evil? But you reminded us that, that God has already um, completely confirmed and validated the destruction. He has broken, he has put death to death by his death. He's broken the stranglehold of evil in this world. And he has promised to wipe away our tears and to, um, to remove and eradicate evil for all time. Um, so if God is good, why is he not eradicated evil? He has already borne the scars of evil in himself, and all evil will be washed away. Guys, as we started today, we, uh, we started with uh, you coming into my home. Uh, we're just going to get very real. Um, we're going a little over time, and so my computer battery is not going to last. So we're going we're gonna to look. You're just going to come with me as we plug in my computer, because I don't want this to drop while we're still going. So this is just uh, real life. Yeah. Um, guys, there's some announcements. We still have a winner to announce about cappuccinos. That is the answer to the question, what is a Starbucks drink called? Um, Nathan, we're so grateful for your time. Don't mind me as I just plug in my computer right here. We're at, we're at the fabled 1%. So uh, let's see if we got this. If we're good. If we're good. If we're good. 
participants. Who is the winner, you're wondering? Uh, the, if the winner is, drum roll please, the winner is, pull it up on my app, it is Hannah. Hannah, you are the winner. Now that's a very, uh, a very common name, so I know you're wondering which Hannah. It's Hannah Chan. You are the winner. Great job knowing it's Puppuccino's. Guys, we have a few announcements, so stay with me for these last couple seconds of our second ever digital reboot series. Uh, our team would love to stay in touch with you, so please, if you haven't already, uh, connect with our team, RZAM Canada, uh, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook. We would love to connect with you. Um, there's, there, there'll be more giveaways and prizes, and you want to be with us. Um, also, our speaking team would love to connect. You can find Nathan Betts at Twitter, and also myself at a whole bunch of different social medias you can see right there including TikTok. Um, guys, today you have honored us by asking us your really important questions, but we'd love to hear your thoughts and your answers. And you can contribute your answers and ask more questions and go deeper at RZIM Connect. That is the online global family for RZIM and you are invited. So join now, you can see the information right there, rzimconnect.org. We're offering a master class in apologetics. There's a number of classes, they're kind of aimed at university level education, but a number of reboot students, of rebooters, have signed up and there's a 20% off a discount for reboot attendees. You are a reboot attendee, so please sign up, help yourself to that 20% off discount for the RZIM Apologetics Master Class. Guys, we are praying for you. We are praying for you by name and we would love to pray for your specific needs. Wherever there is uh, maybe brokenness in your life or, or in family or friends, we'd love to help carry that burden by praying with you. So please email us at prayer at rzim.ca and we'll be praying for you specifically. Uh, but before you go, check out the dates of the upcoming events. Um, we have uh, the next three Thursdays at 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. We're going to be doing the second ever phase of Digital Reboot. So we would love for you to join us. No question is off limits. If your question wasn't answered today, uh, there's, a, there's still a big chance that we'll get to it next time. Uh, next time is going to be specifically the problem of forgiveness. This is so important for each one of us. It's, um, it's amazing how much bitterness or just little the like just little hints of unforgiveness can creep into our hearts we're not even aware and it can choke us out and so my incredible colleague and friend logan gates is going to be speaking to us from his home in toronto and i really hope that you can all tune in from all over the world guys thank you so much for being with us for staying with us over time and have an amazing rest of your day goodbye